morning, good afternoon, good evening, Y Wales, wherever in the world you are today. Um, so today we are, it is uh, Wednesday, September 21st. Uh, Bitcoin is uh, fluctuating about 19,500 ish dollars. Uh, you know, we're, we're kind of on the eve of potentially uh, 6% plus interest rates by the Fed, but nobody really wants to tell us what we're, what's happening. So that's fine. We're going to continue innovating and building and everything under the sun. Um, I'm here today with, with Patrick from, from Jackal. And before we get into, you know, kind of where he came from and what he did, you know, I always like to kind of preface that, you know, this is a really interesting time. Um, we're, we're clearly in a bear market. Um, I don't, I can't say winter and I don't even think that anyone can, can call it a winter yet because there's way too much innovation. There's way too much interest in the space. A winter means it's a barren landscape and there's no one here. Um, we are inundated uh, daily with, with multiple projects, uh, very similar to Jackal. And I know that they're getting ready to launch. Uh, and so I will say that there's a lot of excitement from the dev communities trying to still figure out what's the, na the next phase. Um, the bull run of, of 2020 through 2021 um, was really predicated on, you know, technology that was built years before. Um, no one showed up in 21, built a project and launched it and, and, and had success. Uh, these were these were projects that were built in, you know, 20, 2018, 2019, and 2020 prior, leading up prior to that, that bull run. So uh, with that all being said, Patrick, um, let, let's jump into a little bit of your past and kind of where you came from and how you found yourself here today. Yeah, absolutely, Jay. So um, my name is Patrick, uh, Patrick Dunlop. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Jackal, uh, Jackal Labs, and we're building an infrastructure we also call Jackal, it's Jackal Storage. Um, so my background, I come from digital forensic cybersecurity um, industry, where we used to work for corporations, governments, private citizens, where we'd crack open devices and, and we'd uh, capture and preserve digital evidence. And it's really interesting you ask me about the past, because that's kind of how we got here, where we were trying to build this e-discovery tool for court use actually. And we started building that on something called Polygon, um, where we built this entire chain of custody management of, of digital evidence, because we wanted to know who had access to what stuff before court, a uh, super interesting use case. And then um, that led into us trying to figure out, hey, where do we store this data in a self custodial and, and really clean forensic environment? So only the end user with the private key can access the data in a uh, private and also secure and speedy manner at the same time. So that's kind of an intro of, of how we got here. But uh, that, that's how we're here. Yeah, you know, you know what's really interesting, and I, I know very little about forensic um, you know, data and whatnot, but it has to be clean and it has to be perfect. Um, and I, I did know uh, a specific um, you know, crime scene photographer who dealt with these things, and he, he was one that really kind of taught me that it's like, there is no extras. You don't shoot on rapid fire. You don't ever produce documents or anything else that you're not 100% certain that are 100% going to end up in a courtroom. Um, and so the, the idea of blockchain being immutable and kind of permanent um, really speaks to people needing to think about what they're doing. Because if you have a record of, of your chain of custody, that really does say something um, that it's it's on the blockchain. And, and anyone, uh, judge, jury, uh, attorneys could go through and say, well, hey, there's there's a record here. Why is this not in my file? So I think it makes sense from that that transparency standpoint, even if they don't can't see, as you said, it's it's blocked. They don't know what that record is. They can say there's something here. We'd like to know what that is. And that that's very different than now um, trusting that, that you're being provided all the evidence. Absolutely. And it, it's just right now when you look at uh, judges, you have these seven year old guys that you're trying to uh, explain them what a web browser is, let, it know, let alone is this piece of digital evidence accurate. And um, often, more often than not, it, it, it's not the original piece of data, which is a really big issue as well, because you, you have this issue when you start to create a document on your computer, you lose file version control. And then all of a sudden you have like all these different copies and you're sharing with different analysts and you're sending it to the, the team that um, brought you guys on board and all these different things, right? So try to make sure that you have a clean chain of custody that's perfect with blockchain technology. But one of the fundamental flaws of, of blockchain technology from our view is, is that ability to not have programmable privacy in the chain, where it's really hard for an enterprise to adopt something if you don't have that ability to have privacy. So that's kind of another interesting piece about Jackal, and uh, we're kind of getting into the data storage layer in a little bit. But well, let's, let's go ahead. Let's go ahead and, and uh, let's hear the, the pitch for Jackal, what you're doing, and 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 I got tons of questions. Yeah, 100. percent So what Jackal is? It, it's Jackal's number one. It's a blockchain. It's a purpose-built blockchain built from the Cosmos ecosystem, and uh, we talk about uh, Ethereum versus Cosmos, and or like, I like to say mainframe versus personal computer technology. But um, the, the great thing about what we're building here is we have a blockchain and data storage network that we're optimizing to be super fast, ultra secure, and also easy for people to use. 
So right now in the decentralized data storage space, um, number one, we, it's our core values and our core principles that we think that people should be self custodial of their data. Because right now, no one owns their data. Um, when you go and you use a Google, Amazon, Microsoft, Alibaba Cloud, a third party owns that data. And it's kind of interesting, kind of uh, touch back on the legal side of things as well. Um, when you're being investigated, you they don't go to you for your stuff. They, they go to a third party company, which is also an interesting concept as well. But um, kind of to bring it all, all back around, what we're building is a way for only the end users with their private keys to be able to access, share, manage their data. So it's so secure that Jackal can't access it even if we wanted to. So the way that we do that is, you know, from blockchain technology, you have these validators, right? So you have all these validators and they keep the, the ledger of who has what at what time. But another really important piece is for us to be able to do what we do is we also have storage providers. So we have both two sets of computers that do two different jobs. One keeps the network of the, of the, of the chain of custody or the, the chain of the, all who has all these different files. And the other piece is it's this peer-to-peer -peer network, kind of like a BitTorrent almost. And then uh, when you go really deep into the white paper, we get into all the encryption technology and stuff so that people can have a very simple product, which is kind of like a decentralized Dropbox, really. That's a fascinating. And, and you know, observation and, you know, privacy are, are something that shockingly is not something that, that most people understand is, is a problem on, on blockchain. It's, it is, it's open. You can see it. Um, there, there's a lot of challenges when you're dealing with public blockchains, um, such as Ethereum and, and Cosmos and, and a variety of other ones. And so I think that it's interesting that what you guys are doing is, is helping to provide the security and, and ability for transparency as needed. Um, but not everyone should, should, you know, needs to be looking at, at your business model and what you guys are doing. So I think that's a very fascinating use case. Um, why, did, why did you choose uh, Cosmos as your chain of command? Yeah. So yeah. When, when you're kind of trying to build a, a product, and we, we built on Ethereum originally, or an Ethereum L2, which was Polygon, right? Um, so we, when you build on another tech stack, you're stuck within the box that they give you. And a lot of these tech stacks are optimized for finance and they're not optimized for a use case like data storage or transfer of data or, or things along those lines. So the, the cool thing about Cosmos and the reason why we love it so much is that without the use of any smart contracts so far, we can build directly into the blockchain. So we can build products into the chain that feed the system that becomes Jackal Storage. So whether it's a name service that we built into the chain, we built in a kind of DocuSign or Adobe Sign comparable, we call a Jackal Sign or DSIG. We have a module for that built into the chain, storage module, smart contract module, automated market maker module, file tree module, and also a mint module, which that does, it's Jackal's an inflationary token. So we mint tokens and provide it to storage providers and validators. So the granular control over the tech stack that we use is very important for us to be able to provide the product that we want. Right, because we're we we speak uh, we would reference ourselves as product maxis rather than uh, ecosystem maxis. And the great thing about Cosmos is it gives us that granular control over the blockchain modules, the consensus mechanism, and all those other great things, while still not being isolated to your own chain where you don't have the ability to have confluence with other partners. So it's really hard to have B two B business where they can't just call your contract because it's, it's, it's in a completely isolated garden, um, gated garden or, or walled garden that people would say. So it gives us the best of both worlds. That's fascinating. And that's the reason why we'd want to build. Yeah. So, like so I think that's really fascinating. And, and believe me, there's, there's a lot of reasons to choose chains outside of the Ethereum ecosystem. It's really a challenge when you, when you're, you know, dealing with the gas fees and, and roll-ups aren't always the right answer. So I think it's fascinating from that perspective that you're able to kind of have that level of support um, inside of Cosmos. And I'm sure it's a proof of stake. So, you know, energy efficient and all those, those kind of fun things from there. Um, it sounds like you, you've got a lot of devs that are very busy, just, just enjoying uh, sure. building. I mean, you've got name service, you've got DocuSign alternatives, you got everything else what's the size of your team and and you know how how did you know how did you get them formed or how did you how did you build your team yeah so so it started with just me and a co-op student at a company called inquisitive intel building that e-discovery tool originally right and then uh, it got to a point where we said actually you know what? we pr we have to pivot off to build the underlying infrastructure for this e-discovery tool to work um so we, they were really really great over there they actually gave us a little bit of seed money to kind of kick off uh, this thing going 
And then we started building on the, uh, the secret network as an L2 and we used Filecoin for cold storage archiving originally before we pivoted to our own L1. And we were really lucky there where we were able to get grants from um, a company called Secret Labs, where they've been really, really great to us. And then that rolled into investment. Um, we don't really have any hard feelings with any of these people as we continue to, to build. But how big is the team right now? We have 16 people on staff full time. Um, so nine of those are developers. We have two economists, one person doing system administration, uh, one guy doing biz dev and another guy doing marketing. Um, outside of that, that that's kind of how we built out. Uh, we had a, we were able to have a private round and, and raise some capital so we could kind of get those, that 23 to 30 months of runway that we kind of need in, in a market like this. So we could be, uh, able to produce these products. Yeah, I love it. For, yeah. I love um, that, Patrick. So tons, tons of good stuff. But but now here's where you're going to really help us out. So we've got, you know, our group, uh, businesses all around the globe, um, you, you name it, from public companies to, to private companies to ev everything you can imagine in between. So uh, if you could give me uh, just a, a random use case um, and kind of walk through the flow of, of how a company, and you can choose whatever industry you want, would, would uh, utilize an onboard jackal from kind of, you know, ebb, ebb and flow. Yeah, that's a great, great, great question, actually. So when we start on, on October 26th, and that's when we're launching, by the way, so just a little bit of a shameless plug right there. But um, it's no, going to no, be a, plug, plug away. That's what you're here for, man. It's, it's going to be a B2C product, right? So we have this little Dropbox comparable so we can really get those early users and speak with those users and kind of get new iterations and kind of build measure learn feedback loops, right? So we can build a better product. But at the end of the day, what the business model is of Jackal Labs is we make money by selling unique terabytes of data storage. So the enterprises are that next beachhead where we want to really have a great onboarding experience by the time we get to them, right? So when you think about right now, it's really any, any industry uh, when you have a lot of data that you're storing. It goes way back to the first thing that we said when we got here is you don't own any of your data right now. And, and that's a very scary situation to be in. Um, you look at every single company and you look at the news every single day. I think Uber was very recent. It's XYZ company has been breached and all their information has been dumped on the open internet. And that's plain text. Uh, that's passwords, usernames, phone numbers, emails, IP addresses, all those good things that attackers would use as attack vectors to get into your data. And then also really violate either your, your company or, or even your customers as well. So the great thing about Jackal and a great use case is a very simple one is you get a multi-signature wallet, just like this, around your board of directors, right? And the only way in and out of this security backup that you could leverage on Jackal is you have to come to consensus with this hardware wallet. The only attack vector for this hardware wallet is actually someone going and physically getting your private keys, or they would have to break into your safety deposit box or your bank or wrench attack every single member of the board. So when it comes to duty of care and making sure that you always have a backup, this is a very, very good solution when it comes to high cybersecurity posture, also digital privacy posture for your industry. Um, it's not going to stop people from attacking your business with different cyber threats, but what we'll, we'll do is it'll reduce the, the, um, the, the ability for them to actually kneecap your company for the foreseeable future until you either pay the ransom or, or something along those lines, right? So very simple. It's, and, and, and those attacks happen daily. So that's, that, every, that's, a, every, that's, a, that's a very big need. Yeah, and uh, you have really, really high security posture through these hardware wallets. And right now they're just used for crypto, but uh, what if it's access permissions to all your data? So that's, that's essentially the, the best use case. Um, other good use cases moving forward, um, discovery, as, as we talked about e-discovery, where you have, Jackal is so secure that we can't even access the data even if we wanted to. And the, the important piece of that is when you're sharing data through Jackal, the only two people that can access that file are the two wallets that are associated and have been um, either shared with or created by. And the cool thing about that is you can have very, very secure transfer of data as well. Um, go back to our experience a little bit uh, when we talk about doing forensics for governments, we have a bunch of partners that we used to work with where when you want to transfer data as a government or your uh, tier one unit uh, with the five eyes nations and you want to transfer data between each other, you physically put servers on planes because you, you don't trust the, the, the service providers that you're getting right now. And that's a very, very, very slow way. And it's a secure way, but we think with peer to peer network technology and blockchain technology, we can really accelerate the growth of your ability to transfer smaller or large amounts of encrypted data over the internet.
that's kind of why yeah, we and th- there's a there's a lot to be there's a lot to be said about you know moving large you know petabytes of 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 data around the internet. So so you guys are using blockchain for the directory services. What are you? How are you managing the 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 big you know terabytes and terabytes and petabytes of, of file? Because Filecoin and these other ones are they're cute, um, but they're a long way away from being you know affordable and mainstream and fast enough. Yeah. Uh- File coins are definitely affordable. They, they don't have that speed that you're used to. 24 hours to get your files back is way too long. It's great for like cold storage archiving, but it's also an issue when you have yeah. uh, the ability, you have to manage your own encryption keys. You don't get that privacy that you'd get with Jackal. Um, but, but trying to figure out your, your, your ability to have um, larger, smaller, larger amounts of data moved on chain. When you share files with Google or Amazon, the files don't actually change locations. They just change permissions. So what we're doing here is, is we're leveraging something called the file tree module in our blockchain. And then the storage is managed in the storage module. So you have redundancy of three times redundancy at all times to make sure that you always have your files in different spots. But what we're able to do is through, um, we use AES-256 encryption and we, we use um, all, all kinds of crazy encryption stuff. I won't get too into it because I couldn't do it justice like my CTO. Oh, you, you can rattle it off, man. I, I, that's, yeah. that's, I'm a former CIO. I, I, I know all these things. Yeah, so so the really cool thing about that is we're, we're taking, so if, for example, if I want to share a file with Jay, for example, what we do is we actually take the private key of my wallet address and we take the mm-hmm. public key of Jay's and we create a new key pair basically, right? So that key pair manages the two mm. people that have access to that file. So what we're doing here is we're, we're, the files don't actually, we're not moving physical files, but we're changing who has permission to those files. And they're completely end-to-end encrypted using AES-256 standard. And, and that's uh, currently quantum resistant. We were speaking with a really cool individual yesterday about um, moving away from um, different encryption me- mechanisms because uh, we use elliptic curves right now and people are talking about lattices and all kinds of other cool ways to get post-quantum proof and uh, we can get into that as well about bitcoin security with elliptic curves moving forward for the next 10 years but um we we're, we're going to make sure that jackal in perpetuity has the highest privacy and security posture that we possibly can offer so so is it fair to say because you know you've rattled off a lot of services and, and some of them are very similar to to dropbox and, and you know as a disclosure i don't you know we use dropbox that's about the only uh, thing corporate way we have so um you know we use hello sign it's integrated and there's all these other things so they've created this kind of ecosystem around um our data and you guys at jackal it sounds like you've done the same thing but you're using some different technologies and you're solving some of the security issues and we deal with these on a daily basis um over there so so starting off as b2c is is exactly i would agree with that um because when you get into corporate and enterprise you get into chaos and you know not chaos controlled chaos uh managed by the it directors and then the insurance companies that need to get involved so from from early days it's going to be kind of getting getting people on and getting them used to it um blockchain is not easy <laughs> um you know I, I would not say that we we've got that that point where it's just suddenly everyone's like having fun and enjoying this um you you've got the uh you know the usb keys and, and all the fun stuff that that we deal with so what's the user um, that you have, you know, kind of out of the gate for the first, you know, six to 12 months? Is it just the, the good geeks and nerds uh, of Web3 that really want to kind of test out the bleeding edge of where this is going? Or, or is there a specific use case that you're like right off the bat, this industry, whether it's court cases, wherever it is, like has a desperate need for this? Absolutely. Um, so depending, it doesn't really matter who the user is. It's, it's always on the back end of the systems. Like what we're trying to do in the early days is perfect the product, right? So we want to comp- continue to iterate on the product. So the early adopter of this, the, these kind of things are going to be those end users that are already in the Cosmos ecosystem. For me to think that I can go to a law firm in Ottawa, Canada, this is where I'm from, I guess I, I dox myself a little bit right there. But if I try to convince um, a legal team to, hey, we want you to use your, our product. So what you have to do is you have to go to Coinbase, then you have to buy Atom, then you have to transfer that Atom to this new wallet address in your browser. From there, you have to go to Osmosis and transfer that for Jackal, and then you have to go to Jackal, and then you have to purchase the product. So when we get to the early days of, we call it the Web 2.5 bridge, and bridging over to those use cases, that it's definitely the end game. That's where we have to be for us to be successful in the long run. And there, there's no doubt about that, because that's where all the data is at the end of the day. But when, when it comes to what is that onboarding experience going to look like in the early days, it's going to be a very white glove service if we wanted to get those enterprise on board where likely the earliest products we create for them, they wouldn't even realize it's a Web3 product. 
they would just they would just know that they get that higher security posture and also three to four x cheaper than Amazon or Google. Um, so that's what we're, we're yeah. So so we're, so talk about the where do you where are you finding the savings in, in price? Because you're a web two you're you're two point five, which means you're you're still using a lot of web two technologies, but you got the blockchain um, a little bit on the front end, which which is is some days a savings and some days not, depending on on uh, you know the devs and everything else you're dealing with. But how how do you um, where are you finding the savings from? Yeah, uh, well, first, it's a completely Web3 product. Anyone can go to Jackal and use it permissionlessly, and it'll be, the, it'll be $8 a month per terabyte. Okay. And the reason we want, went with that okay. model specifically compared to um, a marketplace like a Filecoin, for example, is kind of eBay versus Amazon is no one really wants to bid on Post-it notes and pencils. They just kind of want to point, click, and buy it, and then they get access to that. Also, um, we went with this $8 a month per terabyte specifically because we wanted to make sure that... Um, or, or organizations that would come on board, they can make informed business decisions moving forward, knowing that they, the price isn't really going to change on them that much. Um, so when you have that kind of thing, when we cut, where do the savings come from is the question that you asked. We don't run any servers. We, we, we don't run any validators. We don't run any hardware. It's, it's a bunch of engineers and a few biz dev people right now in the early days, right? And that's the decentralized nature of the protocol is what we're able to get that three to four X price savings for our clients. If you wanted to use that web 2.5 white glove service that we could create for an enterprise, that would come with other costs because there's a lot more infrastructure and sales cycles that would have to go into something like that. Um, but if you, for those web three users that want to use it permissionlessly, it's going to be $8 a month per terabyte of data storage. Interesting. Yeah. So it, it's almost, you're, you're, I'm, I'm just comparing some web two companies to you guys. Cause I'm trying to, you know, help formulate this here in my head. And then again, you're pre-launch and you got, you're also just in kind of theoretical phase a little bit right now, which is awesome. And I love, uh, so you're kind of a mixture between backblaze, uh, and Dropbox. If I kind of go, if I kind of am making the right assumptions. Yeah, a, a little bit. Um, it's pretty hard to kind of, if I wanted to put it this way, it's a decentralized cloud ecosystem where. Okay. You can have sign, you can have storage. You, we, we don't do compute. Jackal doesn't do math yet. We, that might be on the roadmap, but um, when, when it comes down to it, what we're looking to do is- There's, there's a lot of spare software. Ethereum. There's a lot of spare GPUs out there right now. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I know that for sure. But uh, there's also other, there's guys like Akash in the Cosmos ecosystem right now that do compute. And um, that's kind of the interesting thing is you can host websites from Jackal. Um, if it's a static website, if you pair it with a compute com provider like a cache, you can have dynamic websites completely on chain with a really high resiliency and security posture, which is really interesting in its own right. But, um, you know, it's interesting. Oh, so, you know, as you talk about that, and I think that's really one of the things that we're starting to see much more in the Web3 um, build out is that Web3 is, is I've started to dub it, it's the modular internet. Um, it's modular programming, meaning that you can do a lot of things on Jackal, um, but you didn't have to create the base OS and that's not uncommon. Um, but the fact that you can easily plug things in and out or other third party users can plug things in and out to manage their data and how they want to flow to it. Um, because you guys are creating, as you said, you're just creating a protocol, you're creating a system of which people can use. You want to attach an AI module to it to, to understand your data. It's your data. Um, you you don't want to read it. You just want to facilitate the ability to store it, uh, and, you know, in a, in a proper way on chain and, and secure it in a variety of ways. Um, thoughts on thoughts on, is that kind of the way you think about this is like, you're just a piece of the pie, not the full stack. Yeah. Well, we're just trying to build really cool infrastructure so we could build the products that we wanted to build in the first place. Right. So that's kind of how we, we, we got here and we were pushed into this ecosystem because we didn't have another option to build something where you're self custodial. Like true self custody of, of your data in a in a cloud storage environment that you still have that ease of use is what we're going for, right? Um, but the great thing about Jackal is you can build smart contracts on Jackal. You can you can build your own products on Jackal. If you want to be an entrepreneur and you want to create human genomic sets where you could sell your own human DNA on Jackal while still maintaining that privacy, you can do that. But the important thing there is that we can't sell your data for you. You retain all the value of everything that you store on Jackal, and that's something that. Um, when you look at your ability to, um, for Google to, I think it's it's thirty something dollars a month per user, just worth of data sales for to marketing and things like that. It's oh, yeah. none of that goes back to the user. And when you start to look at creator economies and things like that, you're creating a lot of value for for third party companies. But a lot of it's like it's almost like a leaky bucket for your own personal data that that should be yours and you should own that. 
And as we continue to kind of go where to see where technology is progressing and we, we'll put on our tinfoil hats here for a little bit of a second. When you start to have brain interfaces, let's say that things like Neuralink or um, Oculus Rifts that are going on your head, who should have, where should that data sit and who should have custody of that data? If it's your every single thing that you're doing with from your facial um, expressions all the way down to if you have the ability to store thoughts through something like a neural link just from the different um, synapses and the different um, electrical signals going on in your brain, where should that be stored? And I think that if we want to have a really free society moving forward, you have to maintain self-custody of your data. And that's kind of, um, if you want to look at our whole, like, it's almost like our uh, Hail Mary pass there of, of the tinfoil hat a little bit, but um, that's, that's what we think the truth is. And we think people should be empowered to store their own data and own their own things. And we, we don't think that this current Yeah, and, and, and I, I, I completely agree. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Web, web three is, is the ability to have ownership, true ownership, not, you know, hey, I've been paying Dropbox or, or you know, any of these other ones for, for storage, um, I stopped paying and, and my data has been now deleted and it's gone. I'm sure you guys have, you guys have a way to deal with, you know, kind of, you know, outdated fees and, and everything else. But, but the bigger part of this is, is that modular part that we just talked about a minute ago, that the concept that, um, it doesn't have to be an entirely separate service that, that as we go forward in the future, that, you know, if you just want your data, you know, kind of integrated into your web browser, because, why does it need to be its whole separate app? Why does it have to be a whole separate production? Um, it should just free flow into whatever dashboard you're using. Um, I, I love that thought and that concept. Uh, there's a few people out there that are doing similar things. Um, one of those would be uh, Store, Store Cloud. You know, and, and I think they're taking a, a slightly similar, uh, but but different approach. You guys have a, a few, you're, you're a little more advantageous. They're, they're just going for the storage, but from a different perspective. Um, what would be the di biggest difference between uh, Store Cloud and, and Jackal? As you guys yeah, storage. Really we have a lot of respect for them, and they're one of the oldest in in, in the field. I, I think uh, Vitalik was actually on their board back when they did the the white paper. So it was like 2014, I, I think around there, 2013 maybe. Um, they did the best they could with the technology that they had at the time. So when it comes to the hot storage aspect of the product, um, they right now, if if I'm not mistaken, don't quote me on this, but I think it's a Google Bridge. If, if I'm not um, mistaken for for the hot storage. And the other thing is that they still leverage Web2 technologies such as usernames and passwords, which are attack vectors when you want to talk about security and privacy and their ability to lock people out of their own things. So what, why is Jackal taking this really hard line in the sand towards self-custody of your data? Um, it's just because we want to have the ability to have applications that need that level of a clean forensic environment specifically. Where, where do you see this industry going? I mean, you guys clearly have a vision. You've got a lot of things going on. And we've talked about, you know, kind of your where you're launching and, and probably, you know, six to 12 months. Um, but it's clear that you guys have a, a very large vision because you're looking at other people that have been in the space for, for years and you're going, we can do it better. And I, I love that. That's entrepreneurialism. That's capitalism. That's exactly why we're here today. Um, so, so give me a little bit of, of let's forward think on this a little bit. And what is, what is a user 10 years from now? Um, and again, do your best in broad strokes. How does it look for them to, to own their data um, in, a, in a kind of decentralized you know, blockchain world? Yeah, uh, let's look at a, at a macro. Let's take a step back first before we get into the, the data specific area. But when you look at, I, I truly believe that every blockchain application will be its own blockchain eventually. And, and the reason why I say that, um, and this is kind of a, it's an ETH Keller mentality, but I believe that horizontal scalability is a lot stronger than vertical scalability. And you can only do so much vertically, right? Um, so for, for the, all those app chains that they need the way for them to be interoperable with each other, that's number one. So if you can adopt something very similar to HTTPS um, for your ability to like very similar to how the internet works, I think that that's where we're going. When we talk about Web3, I think every single SaaS company, every, every single product is going to be its own blockchain eventually. Um, that, that's kind of where, where my thought process is. And the, the other piece of the puzzle is I truly believe we're going to start to live in a self-custodial world and the craze that, that we have for us to own things and have that ability to have ownership on the internet 
is something that's very interesting when we're starting to spend so much more screen time, yet we don't have any assets in that land, <laughs> right? So we, we need to start to really unpack what that's going to look like moving forward specifically. But I, when it comes to the, the, the data storage and, and where that's going to be stored, um, I think it's going to be people like us that are providing that, that storage mechanism so you can maintain custody with uh, where you still have ownership or we can't even see it if we wanted to. And we're not going to be the only ones. I, I, there's going to be competitors and it's, it's going to be a really robust ecosystem of um, more things moving to chain. In, in different use cases, as long as we can maintain privacy, I think that's going to be the limiting factor for our ability to go all the way into uh, blockchain land on the internet. Yeah, and, and let's put it this way, and I, I love that. And again, there's there's no right answer because nobody knows what the future is going to be, although we're all trying to figure it out together. Um, the the kind of concept of you know a gazillion chains, I I believe you're you're correct. To, you know, um, and we will see. You know, there's not going to be one chain to rule them all. I mean, it may it may end up being that that Ethereum becomes the final sediment layer of which every other chain once it goes ahead and says, yeah, we we wrote a little bit over here just to just to you know kind of do a zk roll up type thing. Um, but but the model you described sounds very similar to what Polkadot does with its parachains. Um, and I just wonder, because again, you're, you are now reliant on Cosmos. I mean, and, and from the ability to build inside their chain without having to build your own, um, absolutely is, is relevant. But what, what would be the reason why you wouldn't have gone with, para, with, a, with a parachain and you could have just right off the bat had your own deal? Yeah, uh, there's all kinds of different ecosystems that have app chains. Avalanche would be another one, for example. Uh, there's Polkadot, there's Cosmos. Mm -hmm. The reason why we like Cosmos the most is we like the SDK and the ability to, to have that okay. granular control. Um, also, I think there's power in, in having that ability to choose your validator sets moving into Genesis uh, to really kind of make sure that you have a really great group of individuals that are, that are looking to do that as you slowly become more and more decentralized as you grow. Um, when I, when, if you wanted to ask me what I think the, the, the best technology is, uh, I'm going to have to say Cosmos. I would say Avalanche would be a second, then Polkadot would be a third, but uh, I, I can't, um, there, it, it's so early. It's, there's, no, right? there's no right or wrong answer. Yeah, it, it, It's yeah. so early. And what we're doing is the, the fact that we're on our own app chain and you look at guys like DYDX, they start building on Ethereum, but they have, um, they, they have the, the gut instinct for them to move into Cosmos, for example. And that was a big acquisition for us. If you want to think about it in sports teams terms, but, um, it, it's, I, I think people are going to build where the best experience is. And at the time when we made the decision to move into Cosmos, we were certain that it was the best developer experience for us while still having the ability to be creative and, and have the ability to really have granular control over the protocol in itself. So um, I, I think they're all very similar. I think eventually they're all gonna be have the same HTTPS that I'm talking about when I said, um, if, if I was to make a prediction moving forward, I truly believe that everyone's going to adopt the inner blockchain communication protocol. And the, there's, a, there's a fun thing and a sad thing about that. It's the fun thing is that anyone can call anyone's contract. And that's really, really in, interesting when it comes to our ability to have confluence with other protocols. The scary thing about that is it's going to be a battle for liquidity for a lot of people that are doing finance on the on the other side because now everyone's on the same field, right? So um, I, I think we're going into a space that uh, you see really good cool bridging technologies, but I think IBC is going to be um, the thing that a lot of people adopt moving forward. And I think Ethereum's already started. Um, I know Polkadot's already started. I haven't. I don't know about Avalanche, but Cosmos we have IBC right now natively. Yeah, and I think that those and, and you you guys are doing uh, domain names on on Cosmos with Jackal, so you you do have institutional experience on that. But I, I agree with you. You know, there's going to be um, right now. This is very Web one, and I'm going to assume you're a little little too young that you you weren't uh, around for the Web one days. Um, but this is very similar to like you used to have to dial into servers, um, and you know, back in the early days of Prodigy and CopyServe you know, email suddenly appeared, but you could only email inside of your own thing. So if you were on Prodigy and wanted to do email copy serve, you had to go log out, log in and create another thing. And then, you know, AOL came up and everyone started inter interconnecting these. And today, you know, you can have a web browser, you know, you, you, you hit a domain name, it's pulling up data from 20, 30 different servers, you know, in the background and you don't even notice it because it loads in a split second. So there's a lot of, of meat left on the bone for innovation in this space over the next few decades. I mean, I think we're really that early because we're 
we're kind of taking web one and tearing it down to its core and saying, let's, let's start this over and decentralize it. Uh, so we don't have these points of failure that we have today. And, and I really am excited about what you guys are, what you're doing and, and just your thought process. And that's really where I was challenging you on a lot of this is just to understand your guys way of thinking, uh, a, because you don't have a product that can play with today. And two, um, you know, whatever you build and, and launch this year is going to dynamically change, you know, every quarter for the next few years, uh, as the market shifts, adapts and, and consume and consumer, uh, habits will most likely change. You know, the best, the best uses of this technology is, you know, you, yours isn't even on chain. And most likely there's a lot of other inventions that need to come along the ways. What, what are, what's, what's kind of the main thing holding you back at this point? Holding us back. Um, it's yeah. we, the biggest thing about my team is, is we're so entrepreneurial and we, and we like to really iterate and, and build new products. So we've, we've gone from a, a, a product built on Polygon to a L2 on the secret network, to having our infrastructure on Filecoin to vertically integrate everything into our own chain. So we could have launched a lot earlier. Um, and, and I think if I went through the Y Combinator videos and, and what their opinion would be, we would have launched a very, very long time ago. But at the end of the day, what we're looking to do here is we want to produce the best product possible and we're able to still get that product out within within 12 months. So we've, uh, we've iterated a lot. Um, the biggest thing holding us back right now is every single time we get, we get close to, um, to having everything stable, the space moves so quickly and, and new things are coming out of the woodwork that we want to grab and jam into the product. Right. So if you, if you look at the Facebook chains coming out with the consensus called Narwhal and Tusk, for example, it's just, it, it's, it's a really, really, really interesting consensus mechanism. And I know if I let my devs do what my, my devs do, they probably would have ripped out our consensus mechanism and jammed this new consensus mechanism, breaking everything in the process. But um, the, the, the biggest barrier for us right now, um, from, from a standpoint, I, we're ready to go. We're, we're launching next month. So we're, we're in a very comfortable space right now. I think the it, it's a mental barrier when it comes to the business development side and the sales side of this product. It, it's it's the, the word blockchain in traditional markets is, is kind of like, a, uh, I don't know if I want to get involved with this. That kind of seems dangerous. What is the legislation like? Um, I think legislation is probably the biggest thing, I, I would say, honestly. It's, I, I don't know, and it's very uncomfortable not knowing if the comp country that you live in is a platform risk to your product protocol. That, that's a dangerous, that's a dangerous situation. Um, I, but I'll, I'll let you continue there. Yeah, I, I, compl I completely agree. And, and I'm sitting here, you know, laughing and smiling because it's the number one thing that holds us back. You know, why whales? We are a community. We are, you know, focused on a lot of things, but we want to organize ourselves as a DAO. Um, but we don't have a token or a coin and I, I'm not going to go on chain yet because I, I want to hear <laughs> from a bunch of three letter agencies what their feelings are about that. Um, you know, I, I believe that a majority of these tokens out there and, and chains are, are securities. Um, if you just kind of read the plain language today and, you know, I don't think that unfortunately Web3 is getting the same uh, level of kind of ability to grow the same way web one and web two did, you know, Amazon was allowed to go out for decades and just say, yeah, taxes, yeah, we don't, we don't pay no stinking taxes. And they grew and they were, they had, they had a competitive advantage to grow an asset class that, that probably would not exist today uh, if they weren't given that purview. But on the flip side, you've got cryptocurrencies that every single time we, we trade, you know, Bitcoin to wrap Bitcoin, we're supposed to pay taxes on that, even though it's the exact same asset with the exact same use case. You know, we can't even get 1031 laws uh, put in place. So I, I entirely agree with you that 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 the space needs to mature quite a bit from a regulatory standpoint, um, because the rest of the world is just going to eat our lunch for this. Absolutely. Um, it's also, I, I would be, I'd be lying if I said that other countries haven't even approached my guys already about say, Hey, do you want to come move to this country? And you'll have a great, well, we've already made our decision on what blockchain technology is going to be treated here. And it's a very, very attractive thing for them. Um, obviously I, I like Canada too much. I, I'm going to try to stay here as long as possible, but at, at the end of the day, um, it's not even just the legislation. It's also the support roles around a business, accountants, lawyers, um, all these other roles that, haven't matured enough where I call them and say, Hey, we're this company and we do this thing. Um, is this, can we be a client of yours? And they say, I, I, I don't know. We don't know what the legislation is. Like we can't sign off on this. Like I'll lose my CPA or something like that. Right. Um, so at the end of the day, it's, it's, we have to mature not only from the builders, the legislation, but also the support roles from legal, um, accounting, 
um, individuals that are just regular advisors, we, it's very hard for us where we have advisors, we have to go and find them from other countries because the, the community is so small at this moment, even though the technology has such disruption opportunity. Um, but you also think about things like what makes me a little bit more comfortable is when I hear things like Starbucks is implementing their points program into blockchain. That can't be a security. Therefore, Jackal can't be a security. And I know that they will lobby for that, right? So it, it's it's trying to make sure that that if, if our token became a security, it would be something very, very dangerous for our product, right? It's we are a commodity through and through. If you wanted to build an email server on Jackal, you could, but every single time you send email, is that a taxable event? It's kind of it's kind of crazy if you think about it that way, and it's called gas because it is a commodity at the end of the day, right? But um, God, I'd love to. Yeah, hear no, it, it, it. Yeah, no, I, I think it. I think it's exactly that. It's chaos. Um, it's total chaos, and I know of numerous, you know, very large teams and, and very successful projects um, that literally at any have bags packed. Um, and just sitting there, they've already chosen their destination. They've, they've, you know, they know where they're going and they're just, they're just waiting and watching. Um, and they have no faith in the United States, uh, Canada, or really most of the, most of the first world nations who are going to protect the SWIFT system, you know, for all, all intents and purposes, but you're not in competition with the SWIFT system. You're not in competition with anything else. And I think that's really the biggest issue, um, is that there's a, a true gap an understanding of what blockchain really is. Um, you know, people, when you say Web3 and blockchain, you know, you hear you, you hear crypto and you, you, you hear, you know, Bitcoin and Ethereum. I go, That's, forget all that. We're, we're not here to talk about the coins or the currencies. We're, we're here to talk about the technology of which these rails ride on. Um, and at that point, usually their eyes glaze over and they have no idea what you're talking about. It doesn't, even some of these people are experts in the field. Um, explosive experts in the fields. So I, I entirely agree with you that we have a long way to mature and, and the concept of, yeah, every time you, you want to upload or download a file <laughs> that, that you created a taxable event because you, you use this coin, um, it does, doesn't really fit in with, with the spirits uh, of innovation that we've, we've so long enjoyed in, in our countries. It's, it's super spooky. And it's the, the only thing is Jack was such an edge case, right? Where it's, we're not a finance product. Uh, where we're optimized, we built this entire blockchain optimized for storage and, and the ability to, to have um, cloud products, basically, in a decentralized manner that can be accessible by anyone in a cell phone, being the addressable market in the entire world, right? And that, that's kind of what we're building. And if we get, I, I really, really hope that legislators will start really small, start with one thing, and then go sector by sector of blockchain, if you, rather than just blanket um, legislating the entire industry, right? So if they start with something very simple, and I think um, I, I probably heard a few, I think Kevin O'Leary said this originally, where he said they should start with stable coins and just make that a money market because that makes that makes sense, right? Stable, like they should be a money market. If that's a money market, I'm okay with that. And that makes sense. But don't say everything's a security because that's very, very dangerous. Or saying something that I've heard recently that um, the United States has jurisdiction over Ethereum. I think that was something that recently happened um, it, it was in some legal document. I was speaking with a lawyer previously uh, about that. And that's very, because they have 40% of the servers within the United States. That's a very, very dangerous thing to, to claim. Yeah. That, that, well, that was the big, that was a big changeover, uh, from proof of work to proof of stake is suddenly it's like, Hey guys, you, you created a very large legal, uh, complexity for yourself. And, and again, going back to the spirit, like, do we want to, they, Vitalik said that they reduced global energy usage by 0.2%. I don't know anyone else that overnight was able to do, is able to reduce global carbon emissions by 0.2% globally by switching to this. And what they get as a reward is a punishment of, you know, more taxes and, and more and less, less ability to innovate. And so I, I just go back to, you know, we've got a long way to go. It's very early. And unfortunately, um, you know, if we went to any legislator and, and even the most experienced ones in, in either your country or mine, and, and you, we had them watch this podcast of what you're explaining, what you do, they're not going to get it. They're not going to understand what the technology is. They're not going to understand what you're doing. And they're going to say, yeah, whatever. I'm, I'm happy you brought up. The so I, I entirely agree that we've got that direction. Yeah, I'm happy you brought up the concept of green energy and, and all these tax credits and these different things that we had in, in our tax system up here. I'm sure you have them in the States as well, where with blockchain technology, we can get very, very granular control over how much energy is that one storage provider using. 
So if you want transparency in, in your reporting of how much energy you're using at a company, blockchain technology is perfect for that. We can get down all the way to the um, like very, very small measurements of energy usage for these machines because we know what kind of, how many cores they're running on. We know what kind of machine build this is. We also probably know like a general geographic region based on IP. And we probably know where they're getting their energy from. So when it comes to, hey, I, I want to really crack down on energy usage and I want to, the reason why we, we get a lot of flack is because you know exactly how much energy blockchain is using relative to if you ask a yeah. private company or sometimes even a Fortune 500 company how much energy you're using, number one, they probably, the likelihood of them knowing very accurately is probably pretty low. And, and, and number two, that they probably won't even told, tell you that they wanted to, right? So it's it's a really yeah, no, they. Concept. Really interesting concept for sure. Yeah, I, 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 completely, I completely agree with you. The idea that, you know, Bitcoin is this global energy hog, like, it's not correct. And that, you know, you can do the math a bunch of different ways. And I can promise you just PNC Bank uh, uses more energy globally than, than the entire Bitcoin and, and Ethereum, you know, combined. Um, this is that pause that I talked about, about that uh, 40, right. 45 minute mark. Um, so we get a quick, quick break to take a breath. Uh, fabulous. Really, really enjoy the conversation a lot. There's a lot of things here that's tough to do because I can't see the product. Um, so we're talking well, about right some now. theoretical stuff, but it's really good. We can, yeah, you, uh, want to do a, you want to do a demo? You're welcome to. Yeah, we, we have the product here. This is what it looks like. So this is on the old tech stack, so we can't upload a file. But what we can do is we can, we have really granular, it's Dropbox, right? At the end of the day. It's probably going to screw with me right now. Yeah. Oh, this is fabulous. So, so yeah, let's, so instead of that kind of last section I talked about, let's just, let's just do a demo and um, walk. So uh, that being said, Patrick, let's go ahead and walk through Jackal and see what this, uh, this, this makes a lot of sense now. Thank you for this. Yeah, no, no, it's great. And now that you have eyes on the product, it probably makes a little bit more sense when they talk to the B2C product that we're, we're producing here. So um, right now we're running on the old tech stack. So the devs are pushing a new update. So um, next, next time that it, it, uh, we push the next beta push, I'll let you know, Jay, and you can come and use it. But it's really, you have breadcrumb navigation 100%. up here. You have all that good stuff. Uh, you can go and you can look at different files to say this is a, a logo of, of something or other here that I could probably click on and, and do all that stuff. You can share files, download files. Um, you have all that stuff up here. We have the pop-ups. And this is not going very well. You're gonna have to <laughs> you're gonna have to edit this one out, maybe. But at the end of the day, this is what the product looks like. Uh, you can go share tab. So you can have files that are shared. Yeah. So so very so very very similar to anything that anyone's used. This you know there's there's a there's Dropbox is one of the big ones, but there's there's dozens of, of other ones out there. Um, the, and this is a, a very familiar ability to how do I share files, how do I store data, and how do I share data? Um, and I think you, no, you've got all these things here right off the bat. The, governance, it, it, what's the governance tab do? Oh, yeah. So I don't know if this is built yet. No, the, we haven't pushed the new beta. So everything's a little bit slow right now because it's running on, on the old tech stack. But once we push it, I'll let you know. But governance is going to be done right from the dashboard. Can you see, actually, can you see the pitch deck here? Yeah. Yeah. So when we get into... Uh, all the, okay, there you go. Can you see that? Perfect. Um, so these are all the products that we're looking yeah. to build out. Um, a lot of them are going to be ready for launch, but at the end of the day, governance is going to be built out just like this. So you have all your different validators. You can do governance from the dashboard, and you can do all that fun stuff. Man. Other than that, I love this. This is fabulous. Yeah, that's what it is. It's yeah, uh, so so so. Patrick, what's uh, what what's what's the next ninety days look like for you guys? Yeah, so next 90 days, so that front end has to get plugged into the back end. So we have the entire vertically integrated tech stack working from the command line right now. So what happened was, is when we moved from an L2 to an L1, the entire front end broke, as, as I said earlier, when that's the only issue with my developers, I have to hold them back so they don't keep on breaking the front end. So what's going to happen within the next 90 days is we're going to plug this new front end in. We're going to push the next beta probably at the end of this week or early next week. For everyone to go use so if you're listening and you want to go use the product uh next week would be would be the time for that after that um it, it's making sure that we have everything ready to go um, marketing is all done we're doing a spotlight every single week it is, is a focus of ours where we're, we're spotlighting one specific use case or one application on the jackal protocol so we have stuff like that going on um 
other than that, it, it's just us kind of that final push to get the product out the door, work with the validators, uh, run the, like we practice kicking off the gen block a few times. Um, and once we have all that ready, uh, we're excited to have a really great product for market specifically. Love it. Patrick, yeah. if people want to know more and obviously want to play with it and test it, what's the best way to find you and, and uh, your team uh, online? Absolutely. So uh, you can find us at Jackal underscore protocol on Twitter is one way. We're jackaldow.com as well. Uh, I, I'm sure that I can convince Jay to put my um, my my websites in, in, in the description of this podcast specifically as well. So you guys can go check that out. Yeah, 100, 100% but, we'll have all the links. <laughs> awesome. So go to the link in the description down here and you'll be able to see all the links that we have specifically. Fabulous. Patrick, I really appreciate you coming by Y Wheels. This is uh, Patrick from Jackal. Uh, probably by the time this podcast comes out, you will be, uh, so you'll be watching this and playing with their, uh, with their beta uh, all at the same time. So I'm excited to see you, Patrick. We're excited to have you on uh, Fireside. We'd love to see, uh, see this thing when it launches and best of luck to you and your team. Um, I love the rapid innovation. It's just fabulous. Yeah, we're trying our best. Thank you so much for having us, Jay. Perfect. Be good. Y Wheels, catch you next time. 